Good evening, church. I want to begin uh, with a picture of the church that I church building that I grew up in, Johnson Street Church of Christ in San Angelo, Texas. And uh, when I was about your guys' age, uh, I can remember I disliked Sundays because it meant that Sundays we had to. This screen went off. Did I push it off accidentally? <laughs> Technical difficulties. There it comes. So, oh, okay. It meant we had to go to, to, to worship. And as far as I kind of dreaded that because uh, uh, my dad would sit by me and if I fell asleep, he would thump me in the leg. If I got out of line, then it meant that I was going to leave this uh, auditorium. I wish I had a picture of it. I got this actually offline. But right over here where that circle window was, that was a restroom that if I was too bad, my dad would take me out and give me a whipping uh, there. So it was something that I kind of uh, dreaded. And especially on Easter's, because Easter's for us, uh, my mother grew up in a Catholic family, so they were kind of CEO Christians, uh, Christmas and Easter only Christians. Uh, but uh, for us, Easter was about dying eggs as far as my we'd get these little glass bowls i talked to my brother today about this and we put dye in it and then you take hard-boiled eggs or my mom would blow the yolk out of the eggs we didn't buy the plastic ones she would stuff those then with candies which that's what we wanted but uh the, it was about more about the easter bunny and then the easter egg hunts uh some of you had an easter egg hunt today some of you probably didn't but you're going to look forward to that but my dad didn't hide eggs like this as far as he actually hid the eggs, and you had to go out and look for them. So on days like this, uh, it's wonderful to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Amen? And we get to do that as Christians every day. So uh, tonight, I want to talk a little bit about uh, finding life's purpose in Colossians 1. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn over to Colossians chapter 1. And before we start reading that, I want to just ask you a question. What is the purpose in your life? What is the purpose in your life? And if we were to go around the room, probably every one of us would have uh, different purposes that we might look at. And so uh, we want to uh, look at what Paul gives us. Paul writes the uh, letter to the Colossians. This was a struggling church in Colossae. In chapter 1, Paul assists us in developing a simple yet profound purpose in life. And if you open your Bibles, we're going to look at the text beginning with verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and the brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from our God, God our Father. Verse 3, we give thanks to God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we have heard your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you have previously heard the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world, also it constantly bearing fruit, increasing, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you have heard of it and understood the grace of of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow blonde servant, who is faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, and he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. He goes on to say, for this reason, since the day we've heard about it, and the it that he's talking about, their faith in Jesus Christ, we have not ceased praying for you asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respect, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power and according to his glorious might for the attaining of all perseverance and patient joyously, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. 
lot of times when we think about what it is our life is about, and as far as even discerning God's will, and uh, I, I thought it was interesting as I studied this passage, passage, Barclay says, this passage teaches us more about the essence of prayer requests than almost any other passage in the New Testament. Another commentator and historian says this, we learn from this prayer of Paul's that, it, that he makes two great requests. Number one, for the discernment of God's will, and number two, for the power to perform God's will. And I think that's pretty amazing. When we think about our life as far as and think about our purpose of in life, often we start off uh, in more of the conventional way. What? What do you want to be when you grow up? Did you ever hear that question? That's a lot of times the question that we deal with. What? What do you want to do when you grow up? And I can remember being a, a small child and having an adult say to me, what do you want to do when you grow up? And uh, thinking that, well, I want to be a fireman or a football player or a teacher, uh, never a preacher at that point. But, but we start with the what, then we go to the how, and then we go to the why. That's the conventional way. It's outside in. What we see in this prayer from Paul is uh, an inside-out way of dis discovering the purpose of our life. In other words, it's a remarkable way to discover our purpose because he starts with the why, then he goes to the how, and then to the what. And so that's going to be our three points for tonight. Why, how, and what. So what is your why? What is the why in your life? Michael Jr., and it's not Michael Jordan, but it is a guy named Michael Jr., and as far as uh, you can uh, pull up on YouTube, he's a Christian uh, comedian. But he has a great YouTube passage uh, or uh, segment on knowing your why. And in that passage, he says, when you know your why, your what becomes more impactful because you're walking towards or in your purpose. And he demonstrates this by uh, he's, t he's taking a Wednesday afternoon where he just kind of takes a break from doing uh, comedic work, and he calls on a, a guy in the audience and says, uh, what is your why? And the, and the guy says, or, what do you mean? He's like, what do you do? And the guy's like, I'm a music teacher in uh, high school. He's like, okay, so you're a music teacher, so you probably can sing. Why don't you sing something for us? And so the guy breaks out in amazing grace. And he sings, he says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. He's like, man, this guy is good. He's got a good voice. He can sing well. But then he says, I'm going to give you a why. You're singing this at a funeral for someone that you loved. And I want you, that's your why. Now sing amazing grace. So then the second time when he gives them a why and he has a why, he breaks up. Amazing grace, how sweet. And he's doing all these roles and things as far as singing with such passion because he has a why. He knows the purpose of why he's singing that. Uh, German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche once said, he or she who has a why can endure any how. Knowing your why is important. First step in figuring how to achieve the goals that excite you and create a life you enjoy living versus merely surviving. In the last two years, as far as if we learned anything, you know, a lot of people spent the last two years either living in fe fear or just merely surviving instead of thriving because they didn't have their why. They didn't understand that. So they lived in fear. In Colossians 1.10, he gives us our why. In the NASB, uh, the New American Standard Bible, says, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. The why he gives us there is that we may walk in the manner worthy to please him, that is God, in all respects. Uh, whenever you see the word walk in the Bible, you can think that it means live, because it always means live. The NIV picks this up in its translation, uh, of the passage that says, so you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. That should be our why. That should be our why. So a sermon in a sentence, if you'll say this with me, 
I will live to please God. I will live to please God. And one more time, like you mean it, I will live to please God. That's what he's saying our why is, that we should live in such a way, no matter what you do with the rest of your life, live in such a way to please God. And in order to please God, we have to have faith, don't we? Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. The one who comes to God must believe that he is or that he exists and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. So we, it begins that why of living to please God, we must have faith. And in this passage of scripture, of course, he's showing us then the how and the what of doing that why. Once he gives us that why of living to please God, he says, how do you do that? And it's kind of cool because in this passage, he's given us a corporate prayer. Uh, and, you know, as you think about uh, uh, the models of prayer, we, of course, have Jesus' model of prayer in Matthew chapter 6. But this almost is a model of prayer, though it's not called a model of prayer, of a corporate prayer where he's showing them how to pray as he's praying for them. And he's praying that they will grow in the knowledge of God. And we see this throughout Scripture. I wanted to bring up a couple of passages of those and put them on the screen just for you to look at them. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Ephesians 4, 16 and 17. We see it in Colossians 1, 9 and 10. Uh, we'll look at that again. In Ephesians 4, 16 and 17. So in 2 Peter, Peter puts it this way. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. All glory to him, both now and forever. Amen. Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 says this, beginning with verse 14. As a result, and he's talking about uh, that, every, uh, that there's gifts, that people have this unity in the, the body. And he says, as a result of that unity of body, and that we have people who have gifts that are using those. In fact, I'm going to turn over there just to pick up the context of that before we go that. If you have your Bibles, turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. In verse 11, he said, He gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saint in the work of service to building up the body of Christ until we attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of our Lord uh, and the knowledge of the Son of God to the mature man, to the measure of the statues which belongs to the fullness of Christ. In other words, we, we're supposed to be able to mature and, and have this unity of spirit. And then he says, as a result of that, we're no longer children tossed here and there by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of people, by the craftiness and deceitfulness scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself. So we are to grow. It's kind of a shame if you ask uh, somebody uh, that's a Christian how long you've been a Christian and it'd be bad if you were to ask me, Theo, how long have you been a Christian? And I was to say, well, uh, a couple of years. I've been a Christian uh, for over 40 years, but really, in my maturity, I'm only a couple of years old. In other words, we'd hate it if uh, a person didn't grow and they just remained uh, immature. We see in this passage, of course, he's talking about prayer. And, of course, uh, this uh, up on top is probably one of the most emojis that I uh, use the most as far as uh, uh, so I put that up there but he's talking about prayer and in this passage of scripture he says we give thanks to God the Father our Lord Jesus Christ praying always for you since we've heard the faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints so our growth is going to come through prayer and he shows that as far as uh, as we think about the how he shows us in this passage of, of Scripture how we grow is by having others pray for us and we pray for one another. In fact, uh, prayer uh, is when we pray for one another, 
and talk to God for one another that, that enables us to grow. So he continues in this passage of scripture saying, praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom. And then he closes in verse 10, increasing in the knowledge of God. In other words, Paul is modeling for us this plurality of praying for one another. He uses, we give thanks for the Father always. And since we've heard of your faith, and for this reason, since the day we have heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you. So he's praying that they would grow spiritually. In Philippians 1, verses 9 through 11, Paul says, In this I pray, that your love may overflow still more and more in the real knowledge and discernment, so that you may discover the things that are excellent, and that you may be sere and blameless for the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which come through Christ Jesus for the glory and praise of God. So we grow through prayer, but we also grow through Scripture. Amen? And we see that in the Bible as far as I think about 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable or equipped for every good work. Second Peter chapter 2, 1 through 3, Peter would put it this way, Therefore, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy, envy, slander, and like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. So the how is we have to get to know God and Jesus and we need to experience more of God and Jesus. And we do that through prayer and through scripture reading. I think about uh, when I went to Northwest and I was a youth minister there, Essie Jones was a member there and uh, she had such a deep relationship with God. And I remember going over visiting with her and, and spending afternoons with her and she said to me, Theo, you cannot have a close relationship with God without being in God's word and praying to God. And it's so true, isn't it? We can't have a relationship with God. In other words, if the only time you're in God's word, as good as Chris is, as far as I love to come hear Chris preach, because I grow, because he's given me not only the, the milk that I desire, but he's given me the meat. But if we only are in God's word then, we're not going to grow. In other words, we have to leave here and we have to be people who are in God's word every day and pray. Paul would stress the importance of knowing Christ when he said, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and to participate in his suffering and become him like him in his death. Philippians 3.10. When I think about resurrection, and like I said, uh, a lot of, I'm like Chris, I like this time of year just as much as I like Christmas, because it's a time of year when the whole world, it seems like, you know, as far as I, there were so many people on Facebook and, and uh, in stores just taking time out, thinking about the resurrection that I thought, would that person ever think about the resurrection? I was kind of surprised by some people I grew up with in high school uh, talking about the resurrection or Easter Sunday. And it kind of amazed me. But we are fortunate enough that every Sunday we think about the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Amen. And as we think about that, we can think about uh, knowing Jesus and knowing the power that comes because he conquered death by raising from the grave. So then he gives us, he's given us the why, he's given us the how, as far as the why is to please God, the how that we do that is by uh, prayer and by scripture reading, right? Staying in God's word. And then he gives us the what? We are to bear fruit or have good works. And I'm sure you picked it up in this passage of scripture. He says, so that you will walk in a manner worthy to please God in all respect, live to please God, that's the why. Then he goes to um, 
uh, I, and I took the second point as far as uh, the how, increasing in the knowledge of God, but then the what is bearing fruit in every good work. Colossians uh, 1.10 and the NSB says, a bearing a fruit in every good work. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 16, Jesus would put it this way. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bow. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God who is in heaven. And James, the brother of Jesus, in James chapter 2, verses 14 and 17, would say this. What good is it, brother and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deed? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it at all? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by actions, is dead. This day is a day that, uh, like I said, and Chris said this morning, a lot of the world stops and thinks about this being the Resurrection Sunday or the Easter Sunday. And when we think about that, we have the opportunity to think about uh, uh, God showing his love, God demonstrating his own love towards us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But he didn't remain on the cross, did he? As far as they took him off the cross, they buried him, they put him in a tomb, and three days from there, he arose from the grave. And because of that, we can have power. I began tonight by showing you a picture of Johnson Street Church of Christ, which uh, sadly, when I went, as far as as a young person there, I didn't have my why figured out. And I was more your guys' age and up until when I was in third grade and I was always kind of more thinking about uh, what I would do after church, surviving (laughs) surviving the the church, but then what I'd do after church. But something happened to me in third grade that kind of gave me uh, more direction towards my why. Because I was born tongue-tied. Very tongue-tied. I may have told you all this before because I was born totally tongue-tied, which means that my tongue was fully attached all the way underneath. So it'd be like this, hold your tongue down. That's pretty much the way that I would speak because my tongue was totally tied. That's how I speak. My parents didn't have the money for us to, to for, I, for me to have a surgery to have my tongue untied so it stayed connected. And I had to kind of learn in special ed classes how to speak like this. My name is Theo Jones. Well, most people thought that I must be some kind of kid that was off. But at Johnson Street, when I was in third grade, I had a Bible school teacher. And it was kind of funny because uh, in school, I was put in uh, special ed classes. But still, kids would laugh at me like if I had to read Sally, Dick, and Jane because I couldn't pronounce Sally, Dick, and Jane. But in third grade, I had a a Bible school teacher, Moselle Smith, who would get down and get on my level, and she'd say to me, you're going to be my little preacher. You're going to be my little preacher. You're going to be my little preacher. And she began to give me the ideal that maybe someday I could overcome that with the power of God and through God's strength, and that I could actually do something like that. Even though as I continue through school, all of the counselors would say, you need to think about doing something where you're behind the scenes. Like maybe be a car mechanic or, or something where you, know, you don't have to speak. But I had Moselle Smith saying to me, you're going to be a preacher someday. God can use you to preach. And eventually as I got a job, I had the money to have my tongue clipped. And then I had to begin to learn how to use a tongue. And I still mispronounce a lot of words. In fact, I uh, was going through some old notes the other day, and, and I have notes from people who had listened to me preach and mispronounce a word, and I literally had some ladies that would keep a tab, running tab of every word that I would mispronounce. 
But I could do it, but not by my strength, but through God's strength. And as we think about the passage of Scripture as far as knowing our why to live in such a way to please God, he's going to give us the ability to do that, the how and the why. And if I can do this tonight, be up in front of people and speak, then God can use you to do anything. He can. Amen? And that's the good news. And we know that because the tomb is empty. Amen? And because of that, we know that God has the power to equip us to do anything that he wants us to do according to his will and his power. Tonight, if you're here, maybe you haven't obeyed the gospel and put Christ on. Maybe you believe, but you haven't stepped out and been baptized into Christ. We are to hear, believe, confess, repent, and be baptized, and live a faithful life. And that's the gospel. That's what he calls us to do. Every time we meet, as far as he gives us his invitation, even though we sing an invitation song, he always opens and gives us an invitation, come to me. He's, thin, he's got his hand out and says, come to me, and I will be with you. Tonight, if we can help you in any way, won't you come while together we stand and